This is Freddie News Review, the podcast. And now, America's independent voice, Rob Reddy. Every Thursday, talk it tough with Dr. Tommy Curry. How are you, sir? I'm good, sir. How are you doing today? Great. What are we talking about? Today, I want to talk about Cole Booth's letter and the sexual demonization of black men. Let's do it. So, you know, Rob, I get tired of hearing these monolithic stories about the inadequacy of black men. Uh, and it's running rampant through the society and the academy life. A few weeks ago, there was a blow up on Twitter uh, concerning solidarity for white women and black powers for black men. And following this blow up, this kind of airing of black feminist uh, dissent against marginalization, Cola Booth penned a caustic essay entitled "Dear Black American Sisters." Now, in this essay, and I want, and I'm actually reading a quote so I can say I'm taking it out of context. Booth argues that black men have hurt black women more than any outsider ever could. That's a direct quote. And she continues to say, the darker and more African you are, the less human you are to the black American male. That black American male celebrated and endorsed all things like skinned, Eurocentric, and non-black when it comes to women. It's like watching crack fiends dressed in Brooke Brothers suits. They've become nothing but trash and want people to believe it's just love. In reality, there's no love in any of it. It's all about white status and white supremacy and nigger stock. This is what she calls us, trying to feel like they're living in the white man's grand dream, end quote. Now, this is not so much going to be about Cola Booth and how she represents that extreme variant of black feminism or how black feminism versus pan-Africanism, womanism, black power, etc. What I'm interested in is how this historiography, which is a specific ideological rendering of history, takes the place of an actual material history because it aligns itself with dominant stereotypes against black men, be they heterosexual or homosexual. And despite all this ranting, all these complaints and criticisms about marginalization that's based on sexuality and gender in the Twitterverse, not one scholar has come forward to dismiss Cola Booth's attack on black men. They've remained silent on this attack of black men, just as they do about any assault against black men and boys who murder, rape, or unjustly convicted about rape. So in the academy, black men constantly deal with these type of acad- uh, academic charges, be they peer-reviewed or, you know, these popular sentiments expressed by Cola Booth, and there's a silence on it. There's a assumption that because black men are already viewed as criminals, deviants, rapists, abusers, etc., in society, that while some people may disagree with it, there's never any public defense or apologetic against these types or attacks against these types of things. Now, Booth, Cola Booth reproduces a type of sexual pathology that's found in the work of people like Michelle Wallace's Black Macho. And it's a pathology which has not only been shown to be historically inaccurate. And when I say this, I, I want to be very clear that, you know, historians like Paula Giddings or sociologists like LaFrancis Roger Rose or Robert Staples or Ronald Hall or even theorists like Tony Cobb Bambara have all showed that the, the history, the idea that Michelle Wallace has of the civil rights movement that black men were giving their lives to sleep with white women, that black men only sought power and had no notions of equality or progressive philosophy are false. And, and it's a, a choice by many of these historiographies to willfully ignore the sexual assault of black men by white women and choosing to maintain this idea that black men desire white women despite the work of someone like Eldridge Cleaver or France Fanon or even Angela Davis that argue that black men are desire for white women is overblown because they're, in fact, are victimized by, by white women, right? And it, it gives a narrative that suggests that black men's civil rights activism, that black men's arguments for equality or progress have purely been about sex with white women and not liberation from lynching and state violence, right? It, it suggests that there is a monolithic and disingenuous attempt on black men's part, despite their philosophies and despite their shortcomings, that that's still at the forefront of their mind. See, the problem that I have when I engage in these type of ideological hashtags as a matter of fact and not of perspective is that it suggests that the historical accounts of power are linear and easily describable. See, a lot of feminist and gender scholars forget that black women also demanded gender delineations and traditional roles in the name of social uplift. So when we, I've talked about this before, when people like Anna Julia Cooper demanded black men be chivalrous and protect them and, and you know, make sure they have strong and healthy children next to her demands for imperialism and stomping out Islam. And people forget that Ida B. Wells believed in the myth of the black rapist before her friend Thomas Moss was brutally mar- murdered. Or, you know, and, and, and this is something that we've never met, that people never mention academically, is that Pauline Giddens wrote a, 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 a scathing essay of uh, Wallace's book, The Lessons of History Will Shape the 1980s of Black Macho and the Myth of the Superwoman Won't, which argue that black women's disdain and desire for social and political mobility has always been the coupling genie for white supremacy. See, instead of depending 
on black women scholars and gender and sexuality scholars to tell the stories of black manhood in both its hetero and homosexual variety. Sexuality rather than gender must become a central aspect of how black men deal with racism and the continuing logics of genocide and dehumanization in the world. There is too much academic currency that's afforded for black men to either be silent or co-sign or already existing feminist theories that are largely indifferent to black male sexuality or understandings of black male uh, masculinity outside of problems for current black intellectuals to be trusted. We have to create a way of understanding racism that complicates history, that actually fills in the exploitation and violence that has had befall black men and black women with a notion of sexuality and not a notion of identity politics. Right, we want to truly understand these historical complexities of sexual exploitation, rape, and murder of black men. We can no longer simply refer to black men as a problem or as a pathology. It means that we actually have to understand what's going on. Now, that's not to say that work in this area has not been done. I mean, Thomas Foster's done great work on black male rape during slavery and 18th century black male, sex, or, or male sexuality, Greg Thomas's work, uh, Sylvia Winter's scholarship, and Elaine Brown's work. I was just reading her condemnation um, of Little B the other day. But as a, as a holistic picture, black scholars are dropping the ball because we allow sexuality to remain a, a special purview, a special uh, interest of very specific departments and very specific disciplines without understanding that the sexual exploitation that has befallen black, black men, the types of uh, rage that Cola Booth is directing at black men are not simply scholarly arguments in and of themselves. You've been listening to Ready News Review, the podcast with America's independent voice, Rob Reddy, presented by Reading Communications Incorporated. For all the pressing news you need to know, log on to www.readynewsreview.com.